This week on Arizona Illustrated, we take you off the beaten path in Bisbee, Arizona, from a perfectly preserved historic house. It's a trek if you like to hike and explore, this is the place to meet. To a library that is evolving to meet the changing needs of this community. We don't shush people anymore. We foster conversation, we foster interaction. The future plans of this historic Buffalo Soldier military base. If this can become a center for education of kids and grown ups alike, that would be absolutely phenomenal. And Arizona's first microbrewing is still serving up classic beers. You know, the beers that we make here are primarily English ales. We don't make sour beers. It's not because I can't do that, it's because I don't want to. Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara and today we're taking you off the beaten path in the small and beloved town of Bisbee, Arizona. The town sits 11 miles north of the border with Mexico and it's the governmental seat of Cochise County. This community tucked into the Mule Mountains was founded in 1880 because of the area's rich copper and precious metals reserves and it was incorporated in 1902 the mines here helped the United States meet its copper demand during World War I. In 1920, Bisbee's population peaked at just over 9,000 people. The population declined, but the city slowly annexed the surrounding suburbs of Warren, Lowell, and San Jose. Today, there are just under 5,000 residents, but the area has become a popular tourist destination because of the arts, culture, climate, the food, bars, and well-preserved and architecturally significant downtown area. One of the best things about this area of Old Bisbee is the fact that you can park your car and explore the community on foot. And if you do that, you might want to climb a few stairs and a few hills so that you can step back a hundred years in time and see the home of the first prominent developers of this community. Here's a visit to the Muheim House. My name is Mike Frosco. I was born and raised here in Bisbee and went to ASU and got a degree in teaching. Came back, thought I'd leave after three years. Well, that didn't happen. I ended up in the system for 55. Married my wife and she became interested in this home. My wife is in charge of the, the Mule Lime House, and that's the way I got started with this. I fell in love with this house about 15 years ago, and I'm in charge of what they call the docents. I'm your host today. The house was owned by uh, Joseph and Carmelita Lafour uh, Milheim. They married in 1890. They had the house built took 15 years. And the reason for that was uh, they had uh, the contractor they had, he was uh, he liked to drink his, his beer and he'd get paid, not come back for a while. 1915 was when the house was finally finished. It started with three rooms. What you'll see is uh, a lot of furniture and pictures, whatever that might be, that have been donated by uh, friends of uh, the Muleheims or of the museum, and uh, this is the way we got some of the furniture. When you go into the dining room, you will see a complete set of china from the family. Uh, you'll also see a few other things, and maybe after a while, we can see one of the amazing features that uh, uh, is uh, unique to the area you just don't see anymore. From Main Street, you have to come up what they call Brewery Gulch, and we're sitting on top of the hill. And we overlook 
the, t uh, the really the town of Bisbee is what we're, the house looks right here. And it's, uh, I would say, off the beaten track. What we have here is what we call the wine room. And uh, Joseph Muehlheim uh, set up a, a, like a brewery type thing in here for his own personal wine. And we have his original recipe. He was born in Switzerland came to the United States in search of his two uncles, found out that the two uncles were here in Bisbee. He made his way down here, uh, went to work for them in a, a brewery that they had. In two years, he became owner of the brewery and became one of the richest men in Bisbee. Here we are, you'll see a house sitting on top of a hill and it's always an American flag flying. And you look up, you go, oh man, there it is. And we have steps that you can come up uh, and you can also come up what they call Young Blood Hill. You can drive here, we have uh, parking, but uh, it, it's a trek if you like to hike and explore, this is the place to be. I'll be more than happy to help anybody out. You call me, I'll come get you. <laughs> With easy access to the internet, ebooks, and digital media, it's easy to see how local libraries could become a thing of the past. But here in Bisbee, the Copper Queen Library has evolved to meet the needs of the community. Established in 1882, this is the oldest continuously operating library in Arizona. And among its accolades, well, back in 2019, it was named the best small library in the country by Library Journal Magazine. This is our, our third library building uh, for the Copper Queen Library. This was uh, built in 1907 by a local architect. You can really tell from the, the arches of the balcony, it's a Romanesque revival. Um, that's the, the key feature are the balconies. This is, to me, one of the most protected, well-kept secrets of um, my life that I enjoy just escaping from Main Street and looking at the horizon, the sky's gorgeous, it's beautiful. It's such an incredible resource with wonderful people. I don't have enough words. Funny story, at the time that they built this library, there was a column in the paper um, that it was too modern. You know, Bisbee was changing too fast. And now we're so happy they did build it because, you know, we've got this beautiful building that, you know, we can operate the library out of. And it's, it's, a, it's a local treasure. One of the defining features of the interior of this library is our staircase. And if, when you look at that staircase, you see 115 years worth of people walking up and down it. To us, that, that's, that's a snapshot right there of our history. Um, because, you know, today people are doing the same thing. They're, they're coming in, they're running up to the third floor to grab a book or grab a DVD. Um, and so they're adding to that history. Their old book section is things that were published in the mid-1800s. And I'm a Western history freak, so I can go in there and read things that were published the day it happened. It's not filtered through modern technology or current thought or any of that. And it's right here. We are a small town, but we never let that inhibit us in terms of the way that we think as a library and the way that we 
approach offering services. The Copper Queen Seed Library, which we started uh, in 2017, offers free seeds for our patrons, and it's proved super popular. I, I would say we check out about 800 packs of seeds a year. As you can see, I have so many seeds from so many places. As soon as the library began to develop the seed program, I became involved in it right away. I'm a lifetime gardener, and I save seeds, donate seeds to the library, etc. Libraries are more than books, not that books aren't the best, but um, to have a seed library is really just a genius thing, and um, seeds are everything. They are, they're everything. Yeah, we're just looking at ways to really engage our community. I like to say, instead of outside the box, outside of the book. We just installed a bicycle repair station over at our annex for neighborhood bicyclists to come in and pump their tire up. We've got uh, sports equipment to use in our city parks. We've got uh, bocce ball sets and pickleball sets. We're trying to really think beyond the old paradigm of libraries. This is the Copper Queen Library Annex, which is not a separate branch of the Copper Queen Library. It is what we call an off-site collection. We have things like a lawnmower, a shop vac, a 100-foot extension cord, because some Sometimes you just need that item once. When I first started here, uh, I think I was the one who was shushed by patrons, but um, we don't shush people anymore. We foster conversation, we foster interaction, we foster groups um, using the space and really being more of a community center that's free and open to everyone. I got involved with this program teaching the kids how to dance at the library annex just by some friends that were volunteering with the program and that knew I had a background in Flocorico and I really have a heart for working with the kids. I've been taking my children here to the library since my firstborn son was about a year old and I started going to the preschool story time and they want involvement for, the, for all ages of people. From the moment you're born, pretty much, they set you up with books. And there's classes all the way teaching older people about technology or whatever it, whatever it is. There's classes or something for everybody. Make sure you bend that knee so it goes out to the side. Being in our border community, Bisbee is a really artsy, loving community. And so it's really nice to share some of our local culture with the kids and how to move their body. And um, yeah, it's, it gives them a whole new perspective. Very important to reach this community of Bisbee. This neighborhood, the San Jose neighborhood, is the farthest away geographically from the main library. And it doesn't have the same tourism aspect that Old Bisbee has, but it's also the neighborhood with the most children and families. The biggest resource in our community is our community. Our people are diverse, come from many different backgrounds of education and training. They volunteer for us. I should say our volunteers are amazing. So what's your top two or three? Our job is to support them in every way we can. You know, we are a small town. And our city budget, as you can imagine, is not enormous. So the city pays the employees and maintains the building. But outside of that, um, it's up to us to bring in the income. So in the first beginning of the year, we have a chocolate tasting in February, right around Valentine's Day, of course. And that's our biggest fundraiser. We've had as many as 700 people in this space that you're looking at right now. So the altered books show, the concept of altered books is that you take discarded or recycled books and turn them into a piece of art. I'm a book fanatic. I went to libraries when I was a little girl and that was my escape. 
there are 125 people in town who, have, who are, belong to the Friends of the Library. And if you talk to every single one of them, they would say something very similar. Yeah, it's very dear to me. It's the, my, my heart thing that I do in Bisbee. All this, everything we do, we don't do it for ourselves, we do it for the community of Bisbee. In that sense, you know, this job is, it's a privilege and it's an honor because, you know, we're, we're not only caretakers of the building, but we're caretakers for the entire institution that's been going for 140 years. It all gets tied together into this beautiful package that we call the American Library. This is Warren, a community a few miles south of Old Bisbee, and this is the Warren Ballpark built in 1909, which makes it almost five years older than Chicago's Wrigley Field. This ballpark has been a community center for over a hundred years. Here to tell us more about the ballpark is a member of the board of Friends of Warren Ballpark and a longtime Bisbee resident, Dan Fry. Dan, thanks for joining us. Good My to pleasure. see you. My pleasure. In this colorful mosaic that makes up Bisbee history, where does this ballpark fit in? Well, it was like the second part of the city that came into existence in 1909. One of the mining companies, Calumet in Arizona, decided, decided to build this ballpark for the use of people who worked in town and to build single family homes all around to try to civilize the miners. And fast forward to today, this is still a beloved piece of real estate. This is the ballpark in this country that's been continuously operating for the longest period of time. And this is no mere museum. Baseball is still played here on, on several different levels. You bet. The vintage tournament every year, the first weekend in April, which I invite you to next year, um, happens here as well, where vintage baseball teams playing by 1860s rules. The high school plays all their baseball, all their football, all their soccer games in this ballpark. Recently, the town of Bisbee acquired another important historical landmark called Camp Naco. It was once a home to a Buffalo Soldier military base and was recently awarded millions of dollars for a restoration project to honor its past and make plans for its future. you walk in here, you're not walking into a parking lot. You're not walking into some side road freak show. This is the real deal. This is Camp Knuckle. This is where the Buffalo Soldiers lived. They were separated from the rest of the folks because of their color, but they had a lot of guts. Buffalo Soldiers are, are the name that was given to the African-American uh, units of the U.S. Army. And they were stationed all around the United States, particularly after the Civil War. Uh, but they were located in Fort Huachuca, which also was home for the Buffalo Soldiers here in Camp Naco and a number of other forts within Arizona. We're located about uh, 600 yards from the U.S.-Mexico border. Camp Naco was established as a result of the Mexican Revolution, which started in 1910. And so U.S. troops were gathered on the border. And in 1919, Camp Naco, a permanent encampment, was established here uh, as part of a whole chain of encampments along the U.S.-Mexico border from Texas all the way to Nogales, Arizona. There were 35 of these encampments along the border, and uh, there were two that were made out of adobe. Uh, this being the last of the remaining of those. I'm associated to this place here because of the military. Uh, I'm a soldier once, a soldier forever. 20 plus years, uh, military intel. I retired out of Fort Huachuca, which is also the home of the Buffalo Soldiers, or one of. This place here is very dear and close to me. It, uh, it's hollowed ground, in my opinion. This is where those young men, because uh, I don't believe that there was any women here at that time, but this, this is where they sweated, they, 
bled, they cried, they fed, they slept, they suffered winters, summers. It didn't make a difference, but they were here. They were here to protect the ranchers, the locals, uh, the United States border from the possible overspill of the Mexican nationals that were going across the border over here, fighting each other for control. There's 19 acres here, and uh, originally there were 30 plus buildings here. Uh, the, the goal is to uh, rehabilitate about 20 uh, of those buildings, and uh, we are planning on creating a community center for the town of Naco, uh, as well as uh, allowing for artists and residents uh, to be uh, housed here and to create a community center and an artist center uh, for people to begin to explore different themes about borderlands, uh, about uh, African-American heritage that's here, and a number of other themes. We're hoping to really develop new kinds of histories, new stories, and, and new knowledge that can be created from that. I want to see this place here become the Buffalo Soldier Queen of the Southwest. Rejuvenate the history, hopefully uh, get the place back on order so that uh, the rest of the community and whoever else wants to come out here can enjoy it and, and see it for what it was and hopefully what it will be. Because there's physical remains, there's tangible evidence of what was here. And so that then allows us to tell the story of some of those intangible things about what, you know, what happened here, what were the stories that could be told here. And that's what we're hoping to do. If this can become a center for education of kids, and grown-ups alike, that would be absolutely phenomenal. I have slept here. I have uh, been here at night and This place is absolutely peaceful. We owe it to them. It's, it's our job. We gotta do this. Another area outside of Old Town Bisbee is the San Jose neighborhood, and it's there you'll find Electric Brewing. Originally established in 1987, this microbrewery has been around since well before the craft beer craze swept the country. My name is Joe Fredrickson, and I am the owner, brewer, head salesperson, distributor, <laughs> everything. You're welcome. If he's having another one, I am too. I do everything all the time, and oftentimes there's not enough. This is the first microbrewery in Arizona. Electric Dave was uh, an electrician. He's an old friend of mine. I've known him since about the time he opened this place in 1988. He got into brewing beer, decided he wanted to be a brewer, and then discovered that the laws in Arizona made it pretty much impossible for a brewery to open unless you were, you know, one of the big guys. You know, you can bleep out Miller Coors Budweiser people. Um, <laughs> you had to make an unbelievable amount of beer by the end of your second year to, to maintain that license. No microbrewery makes as much beer as, as they demanded that you make. So he went to Phoenix and, and he lobbied the state houses to get them to change the laws. And when the laws were changed, um, he was the first person to, to get a license. His uh, original license was zero one. Yeah, you would think it was really easy. My name is Natalie Fredrickson, and I call myself the head beer wench. <laughs> I'm uh, in charge of the tap room. I enjoy scheduling the music and listening to the, the live bands, and we have karaoke. Baby, like the 
the door and turn the lights down low. We're not in Old Bisbee. Old Bisbee, you know, hey, I love Old Bisbee. I go there all the time. I've got a lot of customers there. I got a lot of friends there. But, you know, when we bought this brewery, it was out here in San Jose. And yes, there are more neighborhoods than Old Bisbee in Bisbee. San Jose is one of the larger ones. And we're about three miles from Old Bisbee itself. This part was built when the town was still uh, going strong. The mines were still open, and it was, this uh, shopping center was built in 1953. They were building schools out here, and there was a grocery store there and a bank, and it was this was a real, you know, like a regular booming shopping center. You know, back in those days, it seems a little different now. We can see Mexico. <laughs> it's a beautiful view all the way down there. And uh, we have the sunrise and the sunset. We have long, long sunny days, plenty of parking and no, no stairs. <laughs> you know, the beers that we make here are primarily English <laughs> ales. And they're traditional English ales. You know, we don't make sour beers. It's not because I can't do that. It's because I don't want to. I'm a traditionalist in so many ways. And when it comes to beer, beer is malt, hops, water, and yeast, nothing else. You want a chocolate flavored beer? I will give you a stout that has chocolate flavors in it. But you know what? I won't put chocolate in it. We're trying to build up the business of selling kegs and bottles outside, but most of our uh, business comes from people actually coming into the tap room at this point. You asked a few minutes ago about how I got here. Well, I was brewing beer as a home brewer. I lived in the middle of nowhere and I had four day weekends. Um, found out about a beer contest here in Bisbee. I came down, I met Electric Dave among a lot of other people. And a couple years later, I took a job with Dave as, as his assistant brewer. Um, simple as that. And yeah, that's, that's where it all began. She's my baby, I'm her honey. I'm never gonna let her go. Thank you for joining us from here in beautiful Bisbee, Arizona. I'm Tom McNamara. We'll see you next week for another all-new episode of Arizona Illustrated.